Hello everyone and welcome to the Water Ambassador Program. The Water Ambassador Program is a partnership program between Martin County and the University of Florida IFAS Extension Florida Sea Grant Program. Um, we have an exciting lineup of presentations for you, uh, which are hosted on Tuesdays uh, from 12 to 1. Our next presentation in March is going to be on the impacts of fertilizer ordinances on water quality in Florida lakes. And then um, Vincent and I will be putting the registration links for the March, April and May webinar presentations in the chat box for you. We are also really excited to announce that we have our first field trip scheduled. Uh, the field trip is going to be visiting the Loxalusi Headwaters Project. This was a project that um, we presented as a webinar last year, and um, we're excited to be able to be visiting some of the properties that were purchased by Martin County in order to support the, the Headwaters Project. Registration is required, so we will put the link in the chat box, or you can use your phone and take a picture of that QR code, and it will take you directly to the registration link. It's on Friday, March 3rd from 10 to 12 p.m. This webinar, as with all of the Water Ambassador webinars, will be recorded and posted on the Martin County Sea Grant website. Um, that URL is a little confusing and long, so if um, we'll also put that in the chat, or you can just Google Martin County Sea Grant, and you'll find all of the webinars listed by date and topic um, on the right-hand side of the page. We will be um, taking questions at the end of the presentation. We ask that you put your questions in the chat box, and we will be saving those until the end. Um, so after the presentation, we'll address all of those questions for you. And I am really pleased to be able to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Um, Lorna, Lorna Bravo is my colleague um, over in Broward County Extension Office. She's the County Extension Director there, as well as the Urban Horticulture Agent. Lorna leads Broward County's Master Gardener Volunteer and Florida Friendly Landscaping Programs. And she teaches um, a new urban water ambassador short course that's unique to Broward County. Um, I've been fortunate enough to present to the Broward County Water Ambassador Program and it's a fantastic program. Lorna combines her previous architectural experience and creditations with horticultural expertise to deliver sustainable and environmentally friendly water conservation programs in Broward County to help make communities greener. She's a member of the UF IFAS Extension South Florida Hydroponics Initiative Team, which won a national award under the American Society for Horticultural Sciences. Lorna is currently pursuing her PhD at the University of Florida in the Department of Environment or Horticulture, where she researches water conservation in the built environment. And today, Lorna is going to be talking about rain harvesting, the rain barrel project. This is a topic that you all asked us to um, present to you, so we're really excited to be able to offer it up. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to you, Lorna, and thank you so much for agreeing to present to the Water Ambassadors today. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor. And um, let's see where I'm at here. Oh, let me just... Now it is. Okay, so I'm back on, right? Very good. Um, so we're just going to jump right in. Let me uh, make sure. Uh, just what I hope to cover during our time together is we're going to run through um, some uh, water environmental um, concerns, just um, topics that uh, relate to the theme of rain harvesting today, re the reduction of stormwater and non-point source pollution. Um, I will cover benefits of rain barrels. I also will cover a presentation uh, and a project that we've been doing here in, uh, a, in Broward County. As Lisa mentioned, I'm joining you from Broward County. And then I'm also going to be discussing um, utilizing uh, the rain barrels uh, for uh, vegetable gardening. 
Uh, there is a research, some research we're conducting on that. Um, I do have a video on installations, and I will also be covering just the basics of um, the uh, rain barrel um, installations and uh, maintenance, and then also uh, provide the ability, if you're interested, to connect with us on how to order or uh, help you, uh, in you in your individual counties. Um, uh, that will be also part of my presentation and resources. So um, starting off, um, you know, we are in, a, in an urban county here. Um, and you're not, uh, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, OK. Did you see the previous one? Hold on. Did you see that? Mm, nope. Huh. Let me see. So what do you see? Just you. <laughs> <gasps> oh, OK. Um, so maybe you might have taken me off. OK, so let me start again. Hold on, give me one second. You're still listed as co-host, so you should have sharing privileges. OK, give me one second. Ooh. Let me see what's going on here. Okay, so share. Okay. Okay. So give me one second. Yep. We're seeing what your you slides just in note form. Okay. So let me do stand by from the beginning. Okay. Are you okay, you have to just switch the display settings again. Okay, so. Okay, you see? Perfect. You're good Ooh. to go. Okay, wow. All right. All right, so catching up time. Okay, so my visuals were um, just, uh, I mentioned to you what we're hope to achieve for um, the time together. And then I was um, uh, talking to you a little bit about um, urban density that you know, globally more than half of the uh, population is living in urban areas um, that you know, they're relying on our external supplies of free sources, um, obviously such as food and in this uh, particular topic, clean water. So it is projected that uh, 2.5 billion more people will live on the planet by the mid 21st century with disproportionate growth in urban populations. So as it pertains to Florida, everybody loves Florida, right? Everybody wants to come to Florida, but it is the, um, you know, the, uh, the third most populous state uh, has reached a population of more than uh, 21 million. As you can see here, between um, 2010 and 2030, um, the projections is to, by 2030, 26 million. Obviously, that is going to put a lot of stresses in our water supply. Um, you know, from a 6.4 from 2010 million gallons per day to obviously an increase of 7.7. Uh, and so publicly supply water will increase based on this projection growth of 29%. There will also be agricultural demand increases. Um, and um, I know that the Center for um, a Public Issues in Education from the University of Florida conducted a research uh, with 523 Floridians, where obviously, um, you know, the um, the uh, concerns um, are more on, you know, they're, they're sh they think that it's highly or extremely important to have plentiful water supply for cities and agricultural. So we're seeing a shift of interest uh, with our urban dwellers uh, and, and obviously concerns um, as we have this. Issues, you know, it's interesting to think in terms of Florida, you know, we have 90% of, of Florida's freshwater comes from states underground aquifer system. And, um, and it's also very interesting to think that literally we walk on our water, you know, we have this vast enormous um, resources underground formations containing water reservoirs. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's a very precious resource um, that we have here in Florida. Um, as we talked about population growth, the increase, um, obviously, for demand for water would be, um, you know, something that we need to consider. 
Um, and with that comes increased pollution um, and um, definitely uh, with the urban density uh, in, increasing throughout Florida, um, there is um, less um, green areas, more non-permeable um, surfaces. And so there's a decreased um, habitats that filter polluted runoff before it returns to the aquifer uh, in recharge. Um, perhaps many of you guys have seen this um, study from a thousand friends of Florida. Um, it's always, um, you know, striking visually to see, um, you know, what Florida looked like in 2005 as it pertains to the developed land and um, in reddish um, tones here, and then the conservation land in green, which is permanently protected, right? So they did a, a study of what would happen if Florida could grow to more than 33 million residents by 2070, uh, if these current trends were and patterns were to continue, right? And so you would get to see uh, the intensification uh, of the developed lands. Uh, and with that, um, if we're already having issues with our water quality, um, you know, here in Broward County, I always say we're all connected to our, you know, like little mini Venice bodies of water or our re residential properties are. Um, and so we all pay, play a big role and part of uh, our protecting um, as these densities are increasing, you know, so what do we do? How do we address that, right? Um, the other uh, stressors that we have is the non-point non uh, non source pollution, uh, with, which is a term we talk a lot about, you know, which is really pollution from many sources. Uh, runoff from uh, the roof is, is a big, um, you know, concern that we have, obviously, with all that density in urban, um, in an urban uh, platform, you know, storm water and irrigation runoff, the contaminants with nutrient leaching, they're posing significant water quality threats, uh, and make their efficient management less sustainable. So, um, yeah, obviously, if it's not properly managed, our storm water runoff ends up in local storms, creeks, or bodies of water, right? So, this is, um, this is a, a stressor that we also have. Um, but I'm not sure if you knew that South Florida is one of the wettest areas of the country. Um, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, it's always interesting here uh, when we're doing workshops uh, with our urban dwellers that there's a tendency, or if we also are coming from not Florida and you're coming from outside, like we have a lot of people coming from, from Jersey, different parts um, where they're not used to uh, the rainy season here in South Florida, you know. Uh, it's very interesting to uh, talk about this because, you know, rainfall is often, our rainfall here is often enough to meet the, the uh, annual water needs of our South Florida landscapes. And sometimes we tend to forget, you know, that we are blessed with this, um, you know, uh, water. But the problem is that most of that rain comes too fast to, um, to hold on to. Right, and 70% um, of annual rain falls during the summer, right? So the storage is limited in a very flat state of Florida. So that is definitely a challenge. We have all this abundance, but um, how do we take advantage of it, right? So much of what falls is lost to runoff, um, like we've mentioned, and later to perhaps evaporation and plant transpiration. Um, but um, do you know how much, um, uh, how many inches uh, on average, and in this case, I put Martin County, and maybe Lisa, if people want to put in the chat, um, what's the average amount of inches annually that you get? Um, a, if you don't know, um, you know, I'll leave a little moment there in the chat box. It will be interesting. I always like to, it's always surprising to, to see what um, a, folks think or know of, but um, in Martin County, just like in Broward County, we get on average between 55 to 60 inches of um, rain, annual rain. That is uh, amazing, right? Um, U.S. average is 38 inches of rain per year. So you can see that, you know, there's um, quite a lot of uh, water that we're getting. And you can capture and use all this abundance of rain um, through rain barrels or maybe cisterns, right? And other store vessels that can help. So we have an opportunity to, yet to be able to do something with that water, right? Another cool thing that I like to also share is that you can also go into um, the Florida Automated Weather Network, uh, which is FOND, 
um, .ifis.ufl.edu, and you can actually uh, be able to get um, a weather data report of the precipitation. You can get temperature. Um, you can get soil temperature. You can also get rainfall. Uh, relative humidity report based on um, a, whichever county um, you're interested to get, gather data. You can be also um, be able to compare and get an, a report of um, your precipitation rates in your particular county. You can do the report um, on a monthly basis, on a daily basis, and an annual basis, and be able to actually track and see how much water are we really getting. Um, in our counties. And it, you can be able to also study trends and patterns to see when the most uh, rain is happening. Um, that would be a very good planning tool as you're thinking about um, a planting uh, or maybe storing some of that water. So what are we doing with all that free water that uh, we're getting, you know? Um, and how can rain barrels help? And I always say that, you know, rain barrels, uh, although they're tiny, um, they're a wonderful um, a approach to be able to talk to urban dwellers about all these different stressors that we have and be hopefully be able to adopt, uh, adopt them. Perhaps they're not gonna be able to store enormous amount of water, but, you know, hopefully I'll present to you several choices and options that you might have as you uh, want to consider um, a, a, the adoption or presenting the adoption of rain barrels in your programs or in your individual counties. But, um, you know, we always like to say that, you know, these are great um, hands-on tools that we have that can help us have those conversations about conserving water and protecting our water quality. Definitely to help conserve our groundwater resources. As we know, we're, you know, we have 90% um, underground um, sources of water. Um, but I always like to think that um, they can help us divert, store that runoff from all these impervious surfaces like roof that we have, right? So this um, it can also help us to tell where that water can go in an individual residential homes. It can help us to slow the flow of stormwater runoff as well. So um, it is a wonderful way to uh, consider and think about that, right? Instead of, you know, we, we have, we're very flat, we have all this water gushing down and we're just letting it go and not telling it where to go, you know? It could also help us um, to save on municipal well water for landscape irrigation um, and also help reduce the use of potable water potable water in the landscapes. Um, and one cool thing about rainwater is that, you know, it, it provides slightly acidic pH to our coins also. It facilitates the nutrient availability for lawns and gardens. Um, so that's, a, that's another great um, thing to think about in terms of benefits from rain barrels. Um, um, many of you guys might be aware or don't know that we have this wonderful program on uh, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Principles, and uh, one of the principles, number um, a eight, covers uh, the um, importance to reduce stormwater runoff. Um, because we want to protect waterways and replenish the Florida's aquifer. And this particular principle encourages the collection, the connection uh, or the adoption of a rain barrel to your downspouts to collect that rainwater that will help us to reduce that uh, runoff. Um, and it also encourages those um, per surfaces such as pavers and bricks and whitewoods and patios to be able to recharge our aquifer, right? So, um, and also that you could also um, a, be very creative and use your rain barrels to divert that water and work on your rain gardens to retain water and serve as an attractive feature within your landscape. So there's multiple things here um, that um, the this initiative on the Florida Fair Landscaping is, um, is trying to introduce in our landscapes. You know, we have problems with fertilizers and um, and grease um, and pesticides, as um, you might be aware, all the pollutants, right, that are washing through storm drains from our residential landscapes. Um, and again, uh, a, having the problem of that non-point source pollution um, that is that we're being part of because we're just letting that water run. The principle number eight also, um, you know, is trying to help keep water in the landscape, right? So you have all that, um, you know, that roof um, square footage and then that water is just gushing out. 
um, it wants us to consider how can we play our part and keep that water in um, by utilizing uh, those um, porous surfaces and direct downspouts and gutters to porous areas, which um, allows us an invitation to be able to collect and harvest that rainwater from our uh, own backyard. So um, that is a that is a, a great um, a great thing to consider. Um, that is part of our Florida Frame Landscaping Initiatives. Um, one thing, though, we do know, and and that is um, that we get um, during our presentations on rain barrels. Most rain barrels are installed in the backyard, perhaps, and you know, if a resident lives in a deed restricted community. Um, we highly uh, encourage that they should review the documents to determine uh, whether they could, um, a, you know, the, they are allowed to have um, a rain barrel uh, or whether rain barrels are allowed. You know, so always check your community deed restrictions to make sure that if this is something that you want to uh, invite and adopt, right? Um, also, we encourage to check your building codes. Um, that's very important. Um, and um, a check first with the homeowners association, county or city officials, um, and uh, check your state uh, department of natural resources to see if there's um, if there might be any red tapes as you're looking into the adoption of a rain barrel. Um, you know we think that rain harvesting, rain harvesting <clears throat> is going to become very important in this area of of the um, of the state. Very important. Um, another interesting thing is we always like to ask, you know, what is your landscape water source? Uh, when we do, uh, we have a team here in Broward County, we do a lot of um, a Florida Friendly Landscaping inspections, and it's very interesting to gauge the sources of water that urban dwellers are having uh, or, or using, you know. And so we always like to um, ask, you know, how are you watering your landscape? What is your water source, you know? And we find that folks have city water. They're also using canal water. They're using well water, um, reclaim water. And surprisingly, we also see uh, rain barrels um, that are being used. So that's always very interesting. Um, Lisa mentioned that we do the uh, the uh, master gardener program in Broward County. We have 245 master gardeners, um, and we every year we make make it a point to um, collect water samples from each of the class um, trainees, and uh, they come in with various sources of water. And again, we ask them the same thing, please bring samples of um, your source of water for your landscape. And we do a preliminary pH testing. We do, um, a, and we walk them through and we share the results. Uh, and it's very interesting to see and compare the uh, pH levels of uh, those that have a rain barrel versus uh, those that don't, or they have other sources of water. So it creates a great discussion. And it's also very interesting to embed and teach them um, of their, um, you know, what their water pH level is, um, you know, in general, you know, soils in South Florida are showing elevated pH, uh, possibly eight, and because of several reasons, um, including presence of, of calcium or lime in the surface soils. Um, this is very important element to know um, because you, it could be that the irrigation um, has high, high, the irrigation water has a high pH, and if the soil is high, it will continue to remain elevated. If the same water is used for irrigation, so we use this as part of the teaching um, component. We also um, a test for electric conductivity. And um, and we're getting a lot of folks that are um, getting a lot of plant damage uh, in the coastal areas. And this allows us to have those um, conversations um, where we had one uh, plant student that had uh, was an orchid uh, grower and a lot of his orchids were not doing very well. And as he found out, he had a high um, a EC level um, that could probably be doing detrimental effects on the plants. And, and we found that through the class. And so um, he adopted rain barrels to um, counteract uh, the, uh, he was using well water. And so then his plants were uh, doing much better now. Um, but it was another way, an interesting way to uh, you know, include uh, this as a possible solution to an urban dweller. Um, so in Broward County, we have a, a really interesting adoption rate. Um, every uh, master gardening class that we do 
Uh, we always introduce this as, as an opportunity for adoption. You know, re research has shown that rain barrels use can be a good indicator of how households view water conservation. And it, it can also predict how they adopt other conservation practices. You know, so since 2019, uh, we've had uh, a 46% a adoption rate. Uh, every, every class has uh, walked away and our classes are 16 weeks. Um, and every class has uh, walked away with the adoption of a rain barrel. So it's been a very interesting project for us here. Um, <clears throat> and we're learning a lot about how they're using them to model them in urban environments. Um, uh, we've had, uh, these are just some visuals of class of 2019. Um, then we had uh, class of 2020. Uh, sometimes uh, they don't walk away with one, they walk away with two or three. And then what we're seeing is that many of them are also doing a really good job in maintaining them um, and um, and then sharing them in communities, you know, so, or they want more. Um, so they're coming back. Uh, this is class of 2021. Uh, and notice that we ran the class even during the pandemic. So this, this has been an interesting project to see. Um, and um, and to continue to uh, to teach the principles of adopting and modeling uh, this in uh, in their own yards. The other interesting thing that we've also seen is uh, the question as um, is what is your edible garden water source? So the regular was just landscape, right? Um, and can you harvest you know water to irrigate a vegetable garden? And I know uh, if you're here uh, with IFIS, you know, the, the answer is going to be absolutely not, right? But that's not what our urban dwellers are doing. Uh, and this is based on of, of a lot of, uh, you know, uh, surveys that we're doing. Uh, they are using it for a watering uh, vegetable gardening. Um, and so uh, we uh, took it upon ourselves to be able to uh, do some research here in Broward County uh, to test some of these water um, samples. Um, we do know that um, the uh, some of the surveys coming in uh, of urban dwellers using uh, the rain barrels to water uh, vegetable gardens was at 16%. This just kept um, being very somewhat consistent with our service. It's just one of them as an example. Um, and so we realized that this was something that, you know, we wanted to address and, and review. Um, and, you know, the, the roof runoff, uh, rainwater roof, roof runoff from your roof can contain a mix of materials that are deposited by pollution, animals, as well as chemicals used in the manufacturers of those, if you have shingles. Um, so some of the potential um, uh, concerns that that water might have is you could have um, high levels of pathogens, chemicals, or biological contaminants. Um, and so uh, the uh, Rutgers University did a really interesting um, a research on testing and applying harvested water to irrigate a vegetable garden. Uh, and so we took a look at um, how they conducted the, their research. They did 12 rain barrels in Jersey. Um, they were concentrating on homes with asphalt shingles, which was the dominant source of surface in Jersey. Uh, and they were analyzing uh, for E. coli, metals, lead, and zinc, you know. Um, and they were looking at the results against U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency standards or in Jersey water quality standards. Um, and, and it was a really interesting um, research that they did. To, to really look at what it, what are the numbers saying. And if you're interested, you can look up um, the article uh, under Ruggards. You can you know, search for uh, rain barrels, testing and applying harvested water to irrigate a vegetable garden. Their findings overall show that uh, the water quality was very good. Um, and they had other, um, you know, they were gonna continue to further um, do additional um, research. But here in South Florida and Broward County, we took it upon ourselves to um, replicate the same um, a, because we knew that a lot of the urban dwellers are doing uh, and are using that water. And we have multiple roofing materials here. So um, a, we have clay, slate, concrete, metal, wood, 
shingles, Spanish tile, asphalt shingles. And so we did a call out uh, and we know that we have our wonderful, um, you know, birds and our favorite ones are iguanas, right? And so um, concerns that some of these could um, eventually make its way through that water collection from your roof gutters uh, was something that we are interested in. Uh, we have already started doing the water quality testing. Uh, we'll hopefully we'll be uh, releasing some of this information and data as it pertains to here, South Florida. Uh, but we, if you are interested to uh, join in, we do have uh, a rain barrel collection data uh, and we are collaborating with the uh, University of Florida for Florida the Research Center and they're helping us run the data. Um, for very similar um, E. coli and um, the metals. Um, and we have a sample uh, on, in procedure for collecting the water samples. So if this is something that you're interested to pursue, or if you happen to have a rain barrel and you are uh, and is connected to the roof gutter um, and you want to know um, what's in your water, how safe is your water, you can certainly uh, connect with us here in Broward and we'll be very happy to give you the rain barrel collection data. Uh, there's also a blog that we wrote about it, and um, all the resources and everything are in that blog. Um, but if you are using um, the barrel to um, you know, use for your vegetables, um, one of the things that we say is, you know, make the practice safer uh, until you get that water tested. Um, you know, the rain barrel water is not potable. Okay, and it's never meant to be is it's never used for runoff in overhead irrigation. Um, it, you'll be surprised the scenarios and um, setups that we encounter when we do inspections. Um, we with rain barrels or uh, other sources avoid getting water on the plant itself. Harvested rainwater should only be applied to the soil. Um, and um, again, you know, drip irrigation and soil hoses. Um, apply the water directly to the soil without the danger of splashing on your crops. Um, and, and then a watering can may be used as well. So the water does not does get directly on the plant if that is something that you are doing. So I do have a, um, a whole video and installation on how to set up your own rain barrel. Um, uh, but I, I'm going to attempt to walk you through several slides if you're interested on in just um, how to set one up uh, or um, you're interested to um, take any of these um, slides and help you in your individual county to start a rain barrel program. I do have uh, a QR code um, that you can scan and it will take you directly to the, the video. Um, but the first thing that we always like to ask is, um, to that particular homeowner is, yes, I want a rain barrel. Yes, I want to set it up. Yes, this is all good. Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. But we always like to um, ask them, how are you planning to use that capture rainwater? Because you need to really step uh, aside a little bit and understand um, several things before you, you know, you, you adopt one, right? Um, and I, we always like to say that although a small rain barrel, you know, may not provide all the water needed to sustain your plant materials, it can certainly help supplement your current watering schedule. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it can also help you reduce the amount of water that may, that may settle around the foundation of your home. Okay, so again, helping it to um, not wash off and, um, and, and tell where that water wants to go. Okay. So how much water can I collect? Uh, this is something that um, is good to know. Um, and um, although, you know, the, the, this is the biggest question, how much water can you collect? Well, you sort of know how many inches of, of annual uh, rainwater we get on average, right? Which is a lot. And you can always already know um, how to predict when most of this water is, is going to happen um, yeah, through that. Um, weather fund um, station that you can customize and look and graph. Um, but we always like to say that on average, you know, you can um, one half gallon of rainwater per one square foot area is going to run off um, during a one inch rainfall. You know, so understanding that square footage of your roof 
is, is going to be uh, very important. Um, on average, a 2,000 square foot roof can collect about 1,000 gallons of water, okay? Um, and this is probably accounting for about 20% loss from evaporation, uh, runoff, and splash. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, I don't know how much that is, but if you're thinking in terms of rain barrels, that you know amount of square footage uh, would probably, uh, with that amount of rain coming down, uh, will probably require for you to <laughs> get 18 rain barrels. And you're probably thinking, I'm not going to get 18 rain barrels. That's uh, that's crazy. Um, but <clears throat> this is just to kind of get a sense. And these are 55 inch. Um, Know, gallons. Uh, this is just to get a sense of what it would require for you to be able to capture all of that on a twenty on a two thousand square foot roof, right? Um, and that's where you could probably decide. Well, I'm I'm probably just going to capture just one corner, or with this amount, um, you know, I I will probably want to maybe just customize and do more of a small cistern, right? Um, this presentation is not about cisterns, but just know that that's an option. Um, and, uh, but just to give you a sense of um, quantity, um, also estimating your water demand, you know, as simple as um, if you want to be able to grow something and be able to make use of that one uh, 55 gallon rain barrel, um, it, it's estimating your water demand that, that is the importance here to start, you know, so if you have one 55 gallon rain barrel, it can supplement one inch of water to an 88 square foot planting area. That's just uh, an idea. And that could probably help you to meet the, the water needs of this large section of your yard, considering investing maybe on, on a bigger system or, or a larger you know cistern. I do know that <clears throat> you can also um, customize them to be um, you know a thousand gallons um, something much more bigger, you can totally do that. Um, but the other thing is, so understanding um, what is it that you want to do with this water and on average, how much can you actually collect and what kind of square footage can this actually cover, right? Um, it's good to know. Um, and the other thing too is, uh, you know, you can probably get, if again, going back to the same square footage um, that you can collect about a thousand gallons of water, um, you could probably uh, choose a corner of your home and then uh, utilize connecting several of them. Um, you can probably do four 55 gallon drums and this can probably store about 220 gallons of storage. Um, and uh, you can make use of that water and you're diverting that in one corner of your home. Um, and there's multiple ways that you can um, connect them. The other thing that I, I always like to mention is that um, the weight of the barrels. So you're thinking, what am I gonna, what am I, how am I gonna use this water? How much can I actually collect? Um, and then think about where am I gonna put this, right? Because uh, water weighs, I don't know if you knew this, but um, you know, you can um, you you have around eight eight point thirty four pounds per gallon. Okay, so that's that's a that's that's how much it can weigh. That means that a full fifty five gallon barrel can be uh, can weigh over four hundred and fifty pounds. That is very heavy. So you want to make sure that wherever you're going to place this barrel um, is going to have a sturdy foundation, and um, you're not going to be needing to move this around too often because it's heavy. So we always joke and said, if the hurricane comes, fill them up because they're going to weigh a lot. You know, um, the other thing that we also um, like to say is um, that you're going to have to create a strong uh, and secure base for your rain barrel. Um, we show here in Broward County, we do a lot of rain barrel installations and it's part of our workshops. Uh, we uh, show various ways, examples of, um, you know, something that could be strong and sturdy. There are tons of different things that you can do in your base, but a simple eight concrete blocks for rain barrel support um, is, always, is always good to demo, right? Um, this could actually also get you 
um, the, uh, the place for the barrel on a flat plane and center the barrel, strong, level, and secure base. You want to make sure this is completely flat so that weight of water is going to be evenly distributed uh, in that location of your house where you want to have this, right? Um, and uh, and also that is not gonna um, that is gonna keep it from topping or sliding or falling or causing damage to property or harm to people or animals. Okay, so this is a very good thing to think about. You want to make sure that you clear the location. It's gonna be flat, um, and it's very important. Okay. Uh, the other thing to have it elevated is you want to have it so that you can have better water pressure okay so we say a minimum of 24 inches a maximum of 36 inches off from the floor and um, strong foundation high enough to give you a sense of um, gravity and also because you might want to have um, a you might want to have uh, something to catch that water with right so you want to be able to have that clearance otherwise you're not going to be able to get to it um, the other thing is to think about the downspouts, um, allowing for that rainwater to flow into the barrel place underneath it. Um, and so it's always um, the question, well, I don't have a, a downspout. I don't know how I'm going to collect this water, um, especially if it's going to be connected from, you know, you're trying to get the most of it from the roof. Um, but you want to locate that rain barrel under that downspout. Um, so that will probably require some planning and a little bit of, you know, designing. And uh, and I'll show you in a minute some options that you have um, so that you can get the most from that water um, and collect it for transport away from building foundations. Okay, so that's uh, very important. The overflow is, is another thing to consider. Um, you want to make sure that um, you're going to uh, plan ahead to use this water. Um, and so you want to create an overflow flow valve um, to consider because if you don't, then there's going to be uh, probably overflow and erosion, compromising the stability of the barrel, which could eventually cause cracking. Uh, but there's so many great things out there in the market that you can um, use. And, you know, out of all these master gardeners that we've um, distributed rain barrels, we're now learning from them all these creative things that you're doing with the rain barrels to uh, address the overflow. Uh, you have uh, Rainbird, um, a, a, the, the water hose meter. You can actually program that to tell that water when to go, how often to get out. So you can totally customize it and plan it. Uh, we get very creative here in Broward County, so we uh, do all kinds of demonstrations of things that you can do with timers um, and different connections. Uh, connections are totally just for the purpose of demonstration. We're not uh, promoting a particular material. We're just showing um, options that one can do to be able to use that. Uh, but the timer can easily move water away from the barrel to uh, water with a drip line. So it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, and also, um, different things. You can just use PVC pipe and um, tell that water with a one and a half pipe removes the water faster. So um, you can see here different layouts and um, designs. Uh, very simple, uh, but effective um, that you can tell, you know, where that water can go. Um, but again, you want to plan ahead to use this water. Um, also, as part of our workshops, if you are interested in connecting more than one barrel, you can connect them with uh, an overflow outlet can also be applied to another barrel and a LinkedIn barrel design. So we do uh, we do cover that. Um, and there's uh, different uh, details, um, high joining details that you can do. Um, it's um, it's easy to build. You're probably going to, you know, this fills one barrel at a time and empty one barrel at a time. And each barrel needs a spigot. Okay. Uh, and the last barrel gets the overflow. So that's like a little simple um, detail here. You're seeing it upside down. You're probably going to need two people to help you set this up. Um, but you can get, you know, all these, um, you know, small parts. And um, we, we have a like, like a little kit on how to help set this up too. But we also do live demonstrations. Um, and then we also, uh, you can get very creative with your um, pool. Uh, filtering system. Uh, you can use that to help filter, uh, make sure that debris and things are not falling into your barrel. 
um, and uh, collecting that. So you can see that we just, uh, you know, perforated uh, diameter um, large enough to be able to fit this in. So there's a lot of different things, but what we're after is keeping the mosquitoes and the bugs out. It holds the flexible downspot firm. Uh, this is um, assuming that you have the blue barrels where you're not allowed to take off that lid. The ones that we have in Broward County, which I'll show you in a little bit, are a little bit different and allows you to take the whole lid off and be able to maintain it. But if you don't have that option, then um, you can find different details to be able to um, it keep the light out, hold that flexible downspot firm, and helps keep the mosquitoes out, which I'm sure, you know, and also to avoid the agar um, growth in them. Okay, here's just examples of things that we've seen, um, different ideas, uh, again, uh, lifting them, providing a strong base, and creating some gravity uh, feed on them. Again, connecting them and creating different options. Another cool thing too that you can do um, is um, they sell pumps and um, some of these pumps allow you to uh, be able to pressurize and draw that water really fast, really far, about a hundred feet. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can buy to uh, be creative and make the best use of them. Um, so there's a lot in the market that you can also do. So the biggest thing is we have we have this, but we we want to do this, but we have no gutter system, Lorna. What do we do? And so, um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of different things that you can do. You can maybe, you know, if you really are planning, you can just make use of that one uh, 10 foot side of your home, probably on the back. Uh, and you can just build a temporary, oh, a small uh, section of a um, gutter system to be able to bring that down. Um, and help you just to collect water in that corner of your home. Uh, this could be fairly easy to do, uh, but you can also um, a, use a gutter guard and screens that are gonna help you keep the leaves and other sediments from entering or clogging the gutters, um, which is um, once it's installed, it becomes an issue of maintenance, right? So, um, so this is an option. Uh, but the, the gutters supply the most water for sure, right? The other option, which I love, uh, we just did, um, I don't know if you've seen or heard a TV show, Flip My Flora Yard. We just did a whole series on just uh, for folks that don't have a gutter system and they want to use the rain barrels. What are my choices? As simple as a rain chain, you know, so you can tell that water uh, where you want it to go um, from any, um, you know, V, point along the roof line that is going to enable you to capture that water so uh, and use a range to move your water. Um, that's very simple, very effective, and I don't know if you've ever seen that water cascading through some of these range chains. It's very, very beautiful. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's one, uh, something that can be easily adopted and uh, allow it to cascade onto your barrel. Um, uh, so using range chains, um, when you don't have a downspot. There are so many designs in the market. You can just um, look them up um, and uh, it will be a fun, fun thing and they're very easy to install. And there are many styles and they come in many uh, prices. So uh, the other thing we also like to mention is that food grade versus non-food grade barrels. So if you're repurposing or you're getting your barrels from um, a, somewhere you want to make sure that is uh, is a is a, is a food grade barrel, uh, and is not contaminated with some type of chemicals that should not be used to harvest rainwater. Okay, so that's very important. Well, um, how do I know? Um, you can also request um, a uh, material data safety sheet from your suppliers uh, of your used barrel. Um, it would call out if there are any hazards of the materials the containers held uh, for you to know. Um, so that's just simple. And the number one question is, I don't want a rain barrel because, um, you know, I'm going to get all the bugs and the mosquitoes and no, 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 I don't want this, you know. Well, there are things you can do um, to address this, you know, there's um, de depending again on the planning and, you know, there's designs that you can uh, do little simple things to help keep the bugs, especially those mosquitoes out of the rain barrel um, is important, obviously, for our health. 
Um, but there are things that you can do. Uh, you can install screens, mesh, or even the nylon stocking materials over the inflow and outflow areas of the barrels that are going to help keep those mosquitoes and other pests out. And um, you can also do mosquito dunk taps. Um, they have the bacteria to kill to kill the, the mosquito larva. And um, so that's that's something that you can do. Um, how to maintain one, uh, how to maintain a rain barrel. Um, that's, um, you know, another question that we get, you know, you want to make sure that you, um, you're going to empty and disconnect from your downspouts uh, for cleaning before and after the rainy season um, would be an appropriate time to clean, uh, time to clean the gutters and rain barrels of debris as needed. You want to make sure that you can clean the inside of the barrel periodically. Uh, this will be important uh, to keep it working properly. You want to check all those overflow holes for clogs, check the tank fittings for overflow holes and hose bibs. Uh, and you also want to make sure that, you know, there are no cracks or buildup of debris at the bottom of the, uh, the barrel. Um, so um, that's, um, that is just a basics um, year round. The other thing we also said is um, help maintain it to reduce the algal growth in them. Uh, one cool thing that we do here in uh, Broward County is we have fun painting the rain barrels. Uh, we actually have a contest going on, right? But um, although it's fun, it's serving a purpose, which is helping to prevent the sunlight from entering and may reduce the um, you know, algae growth in barrels that are made of white or clear plastic materials. Um, so um, here you can see this is one of our barrels. Actually, the barrel is all black and this master garden wanted butterflies, uh, but she has a mosquito um, screen uh, on top clamp. And this is the models that we have here. Uh, they're black and you're able to literally take off the lid and, and you can just either keep the lid or just put um, a mosquito net with a clamp on it. Uh, and in this case, she had rain, um, rain chains. Um, so it's pretty cool. We have, uh, like I said, we have fun and we try to uh, also uh, use and uh, educate about conservation, butterflies um, and our local pollinators. So we have different themes on how you can decorate them so that you can see what um, a blue barrel would look like before and what it can look like after. So this has been really fun uh, to do. And we do also the small um, a olive little wine gallons here that you see at the bottom and we turn those in to collect AC water. Um, so we, we do a lot of different things uh, with the concept of um, a water. And then we have different, um, you know, um, a templates to, de to decorate them with the same concept though, to uh, help keep the algae from growing. Uh, we have different, um, but there's a lot. I mean, you can actually just buy your own too. You know, there's different models that you can do. These are from some of our master gardeners here in Broward County, um, different ways that they're modeling um, the collection of water. And you're limited only by your imagination. Um, these are some of our um, samples that we do, the different installations and um, the way we talk about barrels and, uh, and present them, you know, also to make it fun and engaging and inviting. Um, and um, like I said, imagination is, is you know, endless. So uh, some of our designs, <clears throat> And um, the University of Florida has, you know, uh, publications that they do what, uh, every year. This was in 2016, talking about water conservation program impacts, um, you know, all the challenges that we talked about at the beginning. And it's great to see that um, a following water restrictions, um, some of the, the adopted behaviors um, that they've had in their annual reporting has been um, you know, installing a rain barrel or using a rain gauge or replacing high water plants, but installing a rain barrel has been definitely one. And in 2017, um, also the 36% um, the based on the survey uh, installed the rain barrel or a cistern. So um, this definitely is a, is a component of those behavioral um, water conservation adoptions, you know, that we can do um, in our urban landscapes. 
Another thing that we also use as part of the rain barrels is to talk about the irrigation uh, restrictions that we have. Um, I know in Broward we have uh, we have them, but um, there's no one policing or piloting them. So this is a great opportunity to when we do inspections to remind everyone that we have mandatory irrigation. Um, and uh, South Florida Water Management has a two-day a week watering, right? And so if your addresses are odd or even, you have specific days and a watering between 10 and 4. So we also use this as an opportunity to talk about these restrictions um, when we uh, talk about rain barrels, right? And we always say that plants don't waste water. We do, right? We do. <clears throat> so if you want to start today, um, we here in Broward are here to help you. Um, if you have a rain barrel program or if you are interested to start one um, or any way that my presentation can help, you know, we're here to assist you. Um, we do have a team. We actually have a water ambassador program in Broward County, and we have several of our um, master gardeners that are leading the rain barrel project. Um, and they're helping uh, to do demonstrations and um, installations and workshops. So um, this is what our barrels look like in Broward County. Uh, we uh, set them up and uh, we put the spigots, they come ready to go. They're not the blue ones, these are the black ones and the, uh, the top comes off, which is great because you can actually be able to maintain and be able to clean them inside. Um, so it's pretty cool. And Marna, um, I just while you're finishing up, I am just going to let everyone know that I'm going to put the evaluation poll up to catch you before you all talk. OK, I'm pretty much done on um, this. I this is just wrapping up, um, just showing um, our workshops. Let's see what else do I have here. <clears throat> and um, Part of our um, proceeds uh, for our rain barrel program, also any revenue that the program does goes towards the uh, Master Garner um, Scholarship Program that we have um, to help support and continue, um, continue moving forward and um, sharing this and um, helping with the adoption of rain barrels um, in urban, um, in our urban footprint. So with that, um, it's a wrap up. I want to thank you. Um, we talked a little bit about a lot of different things, um, all towards the rain barrel rain harvesting project that we have going on here in Broward County. And I want to, um, I also have resources. If you want to watch how to install one, we have a YouTube channel. Um, if you're interested in collecting your rain barrel water for testing, um, you can connect with me. And um, we do have a blog and it has all the links uh, in the forms there. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's very specific to us here in Broward County and other resources here. So, Great. Thank you. thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. Um, and in the chat, you'll notice people are saying, thank you, so informative. Um, we do have a couple questions and a request. If you could put that uh, slide with the QR code for the video back up so that people can can capture that. Um, a lot of people want to know where's the best place to get the rain barrels or can um, they get rain barrels from you or are there places in Martin County to get them? So I don't know if you can respond to that question. Yeah, so we have we actually get our barrels from uh, food grade. Um, it, they actually come from North Carolina. So we have a source um, that we get them from. And we, um, you know, I always joke because I say, okay, we're not in the business of selling rain barrels, but definitely we want to be able to connect them uh, for those that want to, um, I'm, I'm trying to get the QR code, for those that want to uh, be able to get them. So if you're interested, I'll be more than happy to, if you're a county that is interested to get the barrels, um, I can connect you with the source. Um, they're, they're very difficult. They're the black ones. So um, I would say, Lisa, the best way would probably be to um, connect. You know what? Let me just... Um, probably just exit out um, connect um, connect with me and I'll be able to provide that information great so we put um, your email address in the chat and alternatively people can contact myself or Vincent and then we can also make that connection here it is okay 
Thank you. Um, we also had a question as to um, the water sample project that you were doing. Can anyone participate in that or is that restricted to Broward County? No, it, that right now anyone can participate in that. Um, if you're interested to know, you can contact me. Um, there is a blog that I have, uh, which I can probably, if you want, at least I can send it to you and you can share it. And the blog has everything. So that probably might be the best because then you can download the form. Um, and like I've said, we join forces with um, the Fort Lauderdale Research Center, and they're helping me run the data. Great. Thank you so much. Um, any last questions? Put them in the chat. Otherwise, Lorna, I want to thank you again for a fantastic presentation. And thank you all for joining us for um, another Water Ambassador webinar. Awesome. Thank you. Casey says she's going to look into the rain chains. And <laughs> Very good. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of parts, but um, but it's great. And it's definitely a great um, tool to be able to um, take the urban dwellers to the next phase of talking about the importance of water. And, you know, we've seen a lot of folks that start with the rain barrel and next thing you know, they're, they're um, changing and installing a smart irrigation system. So it, those are baby steps, right? So um, those are small behavioral changes that I think, um, you know, we can all be proud of. Great. Thank you again. And um, our next webinar is going to be on um, March 21st. This is um, Dr. Sam Smith and A.J. Reisinger talking about um, the impacts of fertilizer ordinances on Florida lakes. So hope you can join us for there. And um, if you're available on Friday, March 3rd, please join us for our field trip to the Loxalusi headwaters. So thank you all again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next program.